um, goes above and beyond anything and everything else. All right? Okay. So today we are going to be in the book of Proverbs chapter 3 again. Um, and in Proverbs chapter 3, today what we're going to be talking about is the benefits of wisdom. Now, when you think about why you should do something, there are both positive and negative motivations for it, right? And that is, okay, I should do this because I don't want to have to deal with the fallout and the consequences, okay? So that's the negative consequences. But then you can also say, well, I want to do this. I want to be motivated about this be to doing this because I want to have the, the, the advantages of it. I want to experience the blessings of it, the, the, you know, the, the good things about it. In other words, we're talking about both sticks and carrots in order to do something. You know, so you think about the proverbial mule that's uh, pulling a cart or pulling a plow. And so you've got the uh, farmer that's going to be dangling a carrot out in front of the mule's nose to get the mule motivated to go forward. And then sometimes if that doesn't work, well, then you've got the uh, stick that the far farmer uses to kind of give him some negative consequences of, uh, you know, uh, staying back and not moving forward. And so a little bit with wisdom, what we talked about last week was kind of the stick, if you will. Last week we talked about the warnings of what happens if we don't go on and get biblical wisdom. And so some of that stick that we looked at last week was a, a pretty big stick. Uh, if you recall that wisdom was crying aloud and wanting people to come in, but at the same time, God does give us a choice of what we do in our lives. And if we reject wisdom then one of these days we're going to face consequences of that. And we can apply that to a whole different ways across the board. But one of the most important ways that we should apply it is just simply in terms of our relationship with God. Here we have Jesus Christ who is the power and the wisdom of God who is there and he is there with great benefits for us. But if we reject him, then we only have ourselves to, to uh, blame. And I think that uh, it's a very chilling thing to, uh, to think that in the future there's going to be untold millions of people who are in hell who are always going to be thinking, why didn't I accept Jesus Christ when I got the chance? Why didn't I accept that wisdom? Okay, so that's the stick of it, right? Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the carrot side of things. And that is, you know, here is the, the, the negative motivation that can get us to going towards wisdom. But here is the positive motivation of what we're going to be looking at today. The benefits of wisdom that is going to be pulling us forward and trying to get us to understand, hey, this is something that is good for us. And we do need to understand that when we're talking about biblical wisdom, we are talking about something that is good for us. If you remember, the definition of the word wisdom, as far as what we see in the Bible, is wisdom has to do with skill, and it has to do with skillful living. And so if we go on and accept wisdom and try to get wisdom in our lives, then we're going to be living life skillfully, not just simply in this life, but in life to come. And so if we're living something skillfully, then there's obviously some benefits that are there. There's obviously some advantages that are there. And when we take a look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, we start to see some of those benefits that are coming out. As a matter of fact, when we take a look at the first couple of verses, what we see is Proverbs' um, main benefits. That is, Proverbs benefits, generally speaking. What we see in the first couple of verses of chapter uh, 3 is just simply kind of a general statement. And then from verse number 3 through verse number 10 is kind of a little bit of an expanding of that. And so when we take a look at verses 1 through 2, we see a little bit of that general benefit that is there. Now, taking a look at verse number 1 and 2, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. And so one thing that we see here is we see in verse number one what we need to do. And then in verse number two, if we do that, then we see some of the benefits that are involved of it. And so what we see in verse number one is that Proverb uh, or, or Solomon is urging his son. He's, he's teaching his, his son 
uh, whatever son it is, and he's saying, you know, don't forget my teaching. Don't forget what I'm trying to tell you. Don't forget the, the wisdom that God is giving to us off the words of this page. But instead, keep my commandments in your heart. You know, one thing that we need to understand is that when we look at not just simply the book of Proverbs, but when we look at all of God's Word, when we look at all the wisdom that comes from God's Word, this is not just simply something that is there for us to do. You know, that's the way that a lot of times people look at the Bible. It's just simply there for us to do. And so let's check off the list, right? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. And then this is going to be the result of it. But one problem with that is that Christianity is not about what we do as much as it is about who we are. Jesus talked about the Pharisees and criticized the Pharisees because they followed and checked off the list, but yet they were not righteous in their hearts. They didn't have it down deep. They had it on the outside. They had all the things that were there, but Christ compared them to a whitewashed tomb. Externally, they had all the good stuff, right? They had all the commandments. They had all the things, but internally, they didn't have it where they counted. They were just simply full of dead stuff. They were hypocrites is what they were. And so when Solomon's saying, don't forget my teaching, he's saying you need to have them in your heart. Keep my commands in your heart because that's really where it needs to be after all. And so wisdom isn't just simply something that we do. Wisdom is something that we are. It's something that permeates down deep and resides down deep in our hearts. And once we start to have these things in our hearts, then we can start to have some of the benefits there. And if you notice, the benefits here in verse number two is they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Now, what's interesting about that word prosperity there is I, I, I don't really care for that translation of it. When you look at different translations, the translation that, that probably I would pick over that one would be peace. And not that this is a wrong translation, but I think that sometimes people can get the wrong idea from it. For example, when you hear the word prosperity, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Dollar signs, right? Prosperity. And so a lot of times people will look at this and say, oh, okay, if we start to take wisdom and if we start to apply it to our hearts, then it's going to give us long life and it's going to make us rich. And that's where a lot of times people get the wrong idea about things, right? They get the idea that if we will follow God, if we will be religious people, if we will go to church, if we will give the church money, then somehow God is going to enrich us. And there are people who will take advantage of that thought process and um, really fleece the flock, get people to send them money, get people to uh, you know pay their bills, get people to do all these things, because somehow if you do that, then God is going to give you money. So you give me money, and then God's going to give you money. Well, that's really not right. <laughs> as a matter of fact, when you look at the Bible as a whole, you really don't see that principle whatsoever. And so when you look at this verse and you see that it's going to give you prosperity, you might get the wrong idea. But when you substitute the word peace, because peace, if you think about it, this word really is talking about a peace as far as, uh, you know, having a well-being of life, having a success of life, uh, having a, a, a benefit of life, you know, and um, when you look at it in that regard, it makes a little bit more sense. As a matter of fact, what we need to do is we need to understand a couple of different things about the book of Proverbs, especially, which is very, very important. Now, one thing we need to understand about the book of Proverbs is that the book of Proverbs gives us principles, but not promises, okay? The book of Proverbs gives us principles, but not promises. When you read a proverb and you look at it, you'll see that it kind of sounds like a promise, 
And the reason why I caution you about this is because sometimes we say, this is a promise of God. This is a, if I do this, then this is going to be the result, when really it's not necessarily that way. It's really just simply talking about a principle that if you do this, this generally speaking is going to be the result. For example, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about training up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I've talked to a lot of different people over the years who have had uh, adult children who have strayed away from the Lord, and they come to me and they say, I just don't know what's wrong. I trained them up the best that I could. I tried to get, keep them in church. I tried to keep them in the Word of God. I tried to model the best behavior from it. What went wrong? And they're beating themselves up by it because they think this is a promise of God. And obviously, God is not slack in His promises. So maybe the fault was with me. And I didn't train up my child in the way that he should go. Well, Proverbs, because of what they are and because of the way they writ are written, will give us principles but not promises. And it is a principle that if you train up a child in the way he uh, should go, then when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, that is the way that it should work. That's the way that it oftentimes does work. And if you do train up a child, i.e. right here, <laughs> if you do train up a child in the way that they should go, and I encourage you to make that a priority of your life, if you do train up a child in the way that they should go, then when they are old, they won't depart from it. And really, that is a parental responsibility, which is the subject of a different sermon, and I'll leave that for a different time, right? But you get the idea as far as from, um, you know, Proverbs, is that Proverbs gives us principles, not promises. And something else is that when we look at Proverbs blessings, that Proverbs blessings here are really just simply an absence of problems. Oftentimes when we think about a blessing, we think about something that is added to us, right? You know, and so here we are going to our life. We have a blessing that is there, and so this is added to me. And it's something that's added to me. A blessing is going to be added to me. But have you ever just simply stopped to think that a blessing could just simply be that we don't have the added thing there? We don't have the problem there. We don't have the, 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 the consequence that is there. And so when you talk about the blessings of wisdom, a lot of the times the blessings of wisdom really is just simply the absence of a problem. For example, in this verse specifically, where it says, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace or prosperity. So when we look at that, we say, okay, um, if I apply these teachings to my heart, if I keep the commands, if I, if I take wisdom seriously, then it's going to prolong my life many years. But then we look around us and, you know, we can see some pretty um, scoundrelly people that are out there that are living a very long time. And we think, well, wait a minute, what's going on there? And at the same time, we can look and we can see some very godly people who seem to be lives being cut short, right? And so we think, well, wait a minute. How is it that that godly person over there died in their 60s, but yet this scoundrel evil man over here is living up into his 80s? Why is that? Why does this verse not apply in that kind of situation? Well, we need to understand something, and that is that, again, it's the absence of a blessing is the absence of a problem, right? You know, and so somebody who is uh, living a godly life, but yet, um, you know, passing away in their 60s, well, what would their life have been like if they didn't live wise, if they didn't live godly? What happens if they live foolishly? Would they have passed away suddenly in their 20s or their 30s? If, would they have, um, you know, gotten drunk and gotten a car accident at 35? Would they have worn their body out from hard living and passed away at 40? You see, those are things that we don't really stop and think about, right? But when we talk about this, we need to, because again, this is just simply a general principle of if we follow after wisdom, some of the blessings that we are going to have are just simply this. We're going to have peace, and we're going to have um, long life. We're going to have life and peace, and those are two big things. 
You know, when we talk about the benefits of clean living, have you heard that expression? That's kind of a, um, a, a popular expression these days, clean living. Um, when you start to think about clean living, there are going to be some advantages that are going to come from it, right? And of course, people will take that phrase and they'll apply it in different ways. But how I'm applying it today is just simply this, this. When we start to live with wisdom, and by living with wisdom, we're talking about being biblically clean. We're talking about being morally clean. When we start to live with wisdom, we start to have certain benefits that come from that. You say, okay, well, uh, specifically, what are some of those benefits of life and peace? Well, taking a look at verses 2 or 3 through 10, we see some of those more specific benefits given to us. And especially this. You notice in verse number 2 and, or, or 3 and 4, we start to have the benefit of having a good reputation. In verse number 3, it says this, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of, the heart, of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And so here's the wisdom that we are told to have. And notice that it again says that it's not just simply something that we're supposed to do, but it's something that we are supposed to apply to our hearts so that we will be, okay? And that is we need to have love and we need to have faithfulness in our lives. We need to have love and faithfulness to where they won't leave us. We need to bind them about our necks. We need to write them on the tablet of our heart. It needs to be something that is down deep. It needs to be something that's true. It needs to be something that's genuine. It's not something that we can just pull out and use when our mind suits us, but it needs to be something that we'll apply to our lives without thinking. Okay? One thing that we need to have is we need to have love. We just need to have kindness. We need to have a, 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 a sense of of, of, of mercy and being merciful to other people around us. You know, as we go through lives, how do we look at people? Do we look at people with a cynical view? Do we look at people with a, 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 an evil eye, so to speak? Do we look at people and we start to see all the faults and the problems? Or do we look at people and we look at people with kindness? And do we look at people with love? I can tell you right off the bat who I would rather be around. Would I rather be around somebody who's going to automatically, at the drop of the hat, take a negative approach to me, or automatically, at the drop of the hat, take a positive approach to me? I'd rather be around people who have a positive approach to me, right? And you would be the same way, more than likely. And so, if we will take love, and if we will take faithfulness, other translations translate that as truth, which is also one and the same, but if we will take those and if we will make them a part of our lives, then guess what? We're going to win favor and a good name in the sight of both God and man because if we are doing those things, it's not just simply being wise for other people, but it's doing something that God wants us to do because God does want us to love one another. God does want us to do unto others as we want done to us. And so if we are those things, if we're loving and if we are faithful, if we are loyal, if we are truthful, if we are rock solid, so to speak, if we are those things to other people and God wants us to be that way, then notice how we've got this good reputation in both God and man. And how important is that? How important is our reputation? towards those around us. You know, if we have a reputation as being somebody who is the opposite of this, we have a reputation of being unkind, unloving, we have a reputation of being undependable, unfaithful, we have a reputation of being um, uh, untruthful about things. When that is our reputation, you notice that people are going to have a tendency to shy away from us with very good reason, and not only with, with people, but we're going to find ourselves a little bit at odds with God as well. And so if you think about some of the benefits there as far as taking these traits, taking these qualities, applying them to our lives, then yeah, we're going to start to have some of these benefits come out in our life. 
Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get rich. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a, a smooth and easy life. But if you think about those two different things that we talked about as far as having a long life and you think about having a peace in that life, then having a good reputation with not only a man but also with God, that's going to go a long way with it. Okay. Now, moving on to the next couple of verses, in verse 5 and 6, we see that there is a benefit of having good guidance in our lives. Here we got Proverbs chapter 5 and Proverbs chapter 6. Some of my favorite verses in the Bible, by the way. Um, Proverbs chapter 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. So when we look at this in verse number 5, we see a little bit of things that we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. We're supposed to trust in the Lord with all of our what? Our heart. Again, here we're coming back to that idea about this is not just simply things that we do, it's who we are down deep. It's not just simply, oh yeah, I acknowledge God, I have faith in God, I uh, give credit to God. No, it's something that we have a relationship with God, number one, with salvation, but even after that, we trust and we depend on God. And when we trust and we depend on God, you notice that it says that we don't lean on our own understanding. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to think about things, and it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to use common sense about things. It just simply means that as we start to look at God's Word, and as we start to learn God's Word, we're going to trust God's Word over some of the things that we think about what we say. You know, there's sometimes that I look at life and I say, oh yeah, th this is the way that it is. But then I take a look at the Word of God, and it points out a little bit different side of things. And so what do I do? What do I trust? What do I lean on? What do I depend? Do I trust in God, in God's Word, or do I trust in me, in my own understanding? Well, if I trust in my own understanding, it's going to let me down because I'm imperfect. But if I trust in God, on the other hand, then what happens is this. In verse number 6, it says, In all your ways acknowledge Him, which is another way of saying that we're trusting in God and we're following Him. But in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He's going to make our paths straight. He's going to leave, uh, you know, straighten things out so we're not being drifting off over here and off into the weeds and drifting off over there into a ditch, but instead we're right here on the straight and narrow. We're right there. Now, so what we're talking about here is the benefit of having good guidance in life. You know, when you think about life, there's a lot of unknowns out there, right? We don't really know what our lives are going to hold. We don't really know what is going to happen in our lives. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what next week is going to bring. We don't even know what this afternoon is going to bring. We really don't even know what the next minute is. I was going to say the next second, but by the time that I got the words out, it would have already been the next second. But you get the point, right? We don't know what's going on. And even in those minutes and seconds and weeks and everything that we are living, do we really truly understand everything that is going on? No, we don't. Do we even truly understand everything that is going on with ourselves? No, we don't. But God does. And so it just makes sense. If we will rely on God, and if we will trust God, and if we will trust God's Word, then that gives us, again, the best chance of having good guidance in our lives. Now, moving on, in verses 7 and 8, we start to see the benefit of having good health. In verse number 7, it says this, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will be, bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And so if we will start to apply godly wisdom to our, our lives, that is, if we will not be wise in our own eyes, but we will instead fear the Lord and we will shun evil. And so it's not as if, you know, somebody's doing this, is thinking, okay, well, I, I fear God. I'm not afraid of God, but having a fear of God. Those are two different things. But if I have a fear of God, what I am going to therefore do is I am going to shun evil. And so I'm going through my life 
here is something, this is something that is evil, but it looks good. It looks great. Okay? But since I fear the Lord, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shun that evil and I'm going to go on God's way. So there is that path. But on the other hand, you've got another person who's going through their life and they're saying, well, you know, this looks good. And even though the Bible tells me I shouldn't do it, I'm going to do it anyway because I am wise in my own eyes. I make my own decision. I'm not going with God's guidance. I'm doing what I want to do because I'm wise in my own eyes. You know, when you look at the Bible, starting with Eve, every time that approach is done, it gets people into trouble, right? Okay. And so if that happens, well, there's going to be consequences of it. But if we don't do that, and if we fear the Lord, and if we shun evil, then what happens as far as the benefit here is it will bring health to our body and nourishment to our bones. Now, again, we need to understand what this is saying. We need to understand what this is not saying. There's going to be some people who look at that and say, aha, if you will just simply live a good life, you won't need doctors. You won't need medicine. You won't need any of that. But that's not what that is saying at all, is it? What it's saying is, again, giving a principle that if you start to follow after wisdom, there is going to be some effects that will come back to your life that will really even have an effect on your physical life. For example, let's say that since I was using that example before, let's say that I'm a 35-year-old and I go to a bar and I get drunk, even though I know I shouldn't, even though I know that it is uh, foolish to do so, but let's say that I go and do that. And let's say I get in a car, and let's say I'm driving down the road, let's say I fall asleep at the wheel, and I crash, and I wind up in the hospital. You see, if I would have been wise, not in my own eyes, but wise in terms of fearing the Lord and shunning evil, then that would have brought health to my body and nourishment to my bones. The absence of a problem is a blessing, isn't it? But at the same time, let's look at it this way. When you think about going down um, life's road in wisdom, in utilizing wisdom, it gives us some peace about us as well. It gives us some um, peace in our lives. Think about all the problems, the physical problems, that build up over the years because of stress, build up because of worry, build up because of anxiety. Now, we can't get rid of stress. We can't get rid of anxiety. We can't get rid of all those things. But again, if we are seeking after wisdom, and by wisdom, it means that we're living skillfully, and by living skillfully, we're getting the best consequences from life, which would be peace, then can't you see how if we would have been here by not following wisdom, we're now down to here, okay? And here is health to our bodies and nourishment to our bones. Think about all the different problems, all the different medical problems that are created by just simply living a stressful life. You know, people will tell you, if you can reduce stress, then you will prolong your life. If you can reduce stress, then you will increase the, um, the, 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 the quality of your life. And I think they're absolutely right. So how can we do that? Well, by following after wisdom, a benefit. And something else, notice in verse number 9 and 10, is the benefit of just simply having provision given to us. In verse number 9, it says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled with, to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And I know, again, that people are going to get the wrong idea about this and say, see, right there is a promise of God. You give God money, He's going to give you money in return. But wait a minute. Stop and put this really into the context of what it's written. And that is, this is Solomon. He's talking to his son. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so there's application for us. But at the same time, both Solomon and his son were people under the Old Covenant. 
it were, were, were people and all the people that were there were people that if they obeyed the terms of the covenant, the law, then God in turn was going to bless them. And some of the terms of the law was that they were supposed to go and do this. And if they would give God the first fruits, then God was going to bless their crops. God was going to bless their uh, flocks. God was going to make them prosperous if they did this. <clears throat> now for us today, do we have such promises of God? Well, no, because that was the old covenant. But at the same time, we do have certain things, don't we? Jesus said that if we were to seek him first, or excuse me, seek um, his kingdom and his righteousness first, all these things, talking about all things of life, are going to be added to us as well. Okay? So there is a general principle here, and that is if we do honor the Lord with our wealth, if we do honor the Lord with our time, if we do honor the Lord with our effort, if we honor the Lord with the things that God has given us, then God is going to continue give, to give us things in order to continue to honor Him. So this is not talking about if you give God a dollar, He's going to give you a ten. If you give God money, He's going to make you rich. No, it's not talking about that at all. But this is what it is talking about. If we just simply will view money with the rest of the things of our life, as far as things that God gives us, and if we are therefore going to be responsible with those things, then God is going to continue to give us those things. And so if we give God a dollar bill in the offering plate, are we going to get uh, you know, $10 back? No. But if we take our money and if we use it to honor God, then God is going to make sure that we continue to have provision in our life. And that is a benefit. It's a benefit in terms of saying, hey, you know what? I'm not in this alone. I'm not in this by myself. I don't have to worry about all of these things in and of themselves. What I need to do is just simply take what God's given me, be responsible with God's given me, and allow God to worry about all the other things as well. So when you look at all these things on the whole, you notice that we've got certain benefits there. But what we need to do is we need to be sure to follow after wisdom. You know, there is no guarantees in life, right? There's no guarantees that if we do these things that everything's going to run smoothly for us. As a matter of fact, when you think about the only guarantee that we really have in life is that it probably won't go smooth for us. You know, living in this life, in this life that is affected by sin, um, that's the only constant and that's the only guarantee that we have is that this isn't heaven and this isn't a perfect place and this is going to be filled with problems and, 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 and situations and disappointments and everything like that, right? So if this is the way that life is, we need to understand that wisdom, it's what is going to give us the best shot of living this life successfully. In other words, it's like this. You've heard the expression, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? Well, I hate to tell you this, but life is lemons, <laughs> right? You know, we are living in this life of sin. We are living in this life of problems. We are living in this life of sickness. We are living in this life, and it all comes down to the, the same ending, death. If that's not lemons, I don't know what is, right? And so if we have these lemons, what are we going to do with them? Wisdom is our best shot of taking those lemons and making lemonade with it. It's living skillfully. But in order to do that, we've got to apply our hearts to wisdom. Because it's not just simply things that we do. It's who we are down deep. And it really starts with knowing Jesus Christ is our Savior, right? Because here is Jesus Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God for us. If we want to live something that is skillful, if we want to have advantages, 
of not just simply something in this life, but in something of eternal life, then we're going to accept Jesus Christ. And accepting Jesus Christ is not just simply something that we do on the outside. It's not just simply something that we say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, right? I think that there are many people that are running around these days, and if you come up to them and say, are you a Christian? They'll say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? What makes you think that you're a Christian? Well, I, I call myself one. Well, okay, you can call yourself a Christian, but at the same time, if you think about it, you call yourself anything you want, right? You know, I can call myself a bumblebee, but it doesn't make sense that I can fly. Okay? You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself, but it doesn't change the reality of the situation. And so if you want to call yourself a Christian, that's fine, but does that really make you a Christian? No, it does not. Somebody say, well, I'm a Christian because I, I've, I've gone to church before. I, I, I'm a Christian because I give money. I go give, uh, I'm a Christian because I read the Bible. I'm a Christian because I, I, I pray to prayer. I'm a Christian because, well, wait a minute. That still is what you do. It's not who you are. When you think about it, all the righteous things, all the good things in the world is never going to save us. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says that He saves us by His mercy, not by the righteous things that we have done, but because of His mercy. You see, accepting Jesus Christ and being a Christian is really coming to the point in our life where we realize, hey, we're not wise, we're foolish. We're not righteous, we're sinners. And because of that, <clears throat> we need to have the wisdom of Jesus Christ in our life. We need to have that forgiveness. We need to have that mercy that's applied to us. And when we come to that point and we realize that, oh, Jesus Christ was the one that God sent to this earth to live for us and die for us, to save us, and He has been resurrected on our behalf. And we, we take that, and we know that that is the reason why God saves us. And we trust it, we believe it, and we turn to the Lord. Remember that God loves us so much that He was willing to send Jesus Christ to this earth to die for us on the cross. And when we believe that and we trust it, then God's going to save us. Not because of anything good we do, but because of everything God has promised. And so, let's be sure to seek after wisdom. Wisdom of knowing God through Jesus Christ, number one. <clears throat> but then after that, a wisdom of just simply taking the Word of God and applying it to our, our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Not just simply what we do, but who we are. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the time that we spent in your word. Lord, please give us your grace and your mercy so that we can know you and know you better. Help us to um, always seek after wisdom. And Lord, please forgive us of our faults and forgive us of our failures. Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.